Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar. Um, my name is Fiona Brocklehurst. Uh, I thought I'd include a, a photo on the first slide so you have a face to connect to the voice. Uh, I'm talking today about two of the um, European Commission labels operating in the EU, uh, the energy efficiency label and the energy star label. So today I'm going to um, give an introduction, talk about energy star first, um, what it covers and what it's done, and then the same sort of thing for the energy efficiency label. So starting off, what what do labels do? Why do we use energy efficiency labels? Um, so this is a graph showing the distribution of sales of products against their efficiency. And um, the initial um, market is uh, the red, red graph. And then if you add standards, um, you cut off the bottom performing, you get the blue graph. And then if you add labels, ideally, you encourage the more efficient products, and you get this pull of the market. So um, in the EU, the Eco Design Directive provides the minimum energy performance standards that um, cut off the worst products. But labels are a way of, uh, obviously they work together, a way of distinguishing the energy performance. So there's an incentive for manufacturers to make products, innovate to make products that are better. Um, and consumers can see what they're getting. They can choose to buy something that's more efficient. That's the basic kind of principle. Um, then very generally there are two types of labels. There are endorsement labels, which are pretty much always voluntary. They're very simple visually in terms of the information on the label. So an endorsement label is either there or it's not. So you can just say, okay, if it's got the logo, it's meeting some specification. The specification might be quite complicated, but the label is really simple. Um, We've got some examples from around the world there. We've got um, Canada, India, Korea, Vietnam, and China. Um, on the right there, we have the comparative labels. So that's talking about, that might be voluntary or mandatory. And that's talking about how this particular product performs in terms of energy relative to the rest of the market. So that's kind of where we're coming from. Um, within endorsement labels, they could be on one aspect, like just energy efficiency, or they can cover a whole range of environmental impacts, um, in which case they're normally called eco-labels. Um, the only eco-label across the whole of the EU is the EU eco-label, with a little flower symbol at the top there. Um, other ones operate within regions or in particular countries. So, for example, we have below the Blue Angel, from Germany, uh, Milieu Kur, pardon my pronunciation, from Netherlands, the Austrian eco label, um, Croatia, um, the um, Nordic Swan, which operates in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Iceland. So it's just kind of a snapshot of that. Moving on to the particular endorsement label that um, I'm talking about today. That is Energy Star. Uh, Energy Star is an endorsement label um, that was started and is still very much an American program, um, operated by, you can see their logo in the top right there, the US Environmental Protection Agency for the US Department of Energy. Uh, it's been running a long time. It started in 1992. It covers a lot of different areas. Um, so it covers, and that's what's illustrated by the pictures here. We've got new homes, we've got commercial buildings, manufacturing, and um, awards and partnership schemes. So there's all of that as well as the product labeling that we're very familiar with. And it's just an example, we've got lamps and um, refrigerators at the bottom there. It's very, very well known in the way it's established in the States. Um, with consumer awareness is very high. So 88% of households, when they did a survey last year, recognized the label. So it's starting from a very strong base. In addition to operating in the US, um, on particular product area, which is uh, office equipment, um, 
it operates internationally as well, and these are the international partners. So we have um, going clockwise, Japan, Australia, Taiwan, possibly the only flag that I didn't recognize, I admit, um, Switzerland, New Zealand, and Canada. So narrowing it again to specifically the EU, Energy Star. So we started, the Commission started talking to um, the US about Energy Star back in 2000. The first agreement was made in 2003, and there are agreements for sort of five-year periods, with the current third agreement running until February 2018. Um, the third agreement's a bit different from those before. Uh, at that point, the US decided they wanted to ask for third-party certification which meant in order to qualify for Energy Star, somebody outside of the manufacturer or supplier that was listing the product needed to have tested it and provide a certificate that proved that it met it. Um, the EU decided they didn't want to move to that system and they would stay with the existing system where people self-certify. They say, we have met it, and they are not required to provide proof um, up front in order to be able to uh, qualify. So I talked about office equipment, which possibly isn't very meaningful. Um, so we've got examples here of the different product groups that are covered under EU Energy Star. So we have displays, going clockwise again. We have imaging equipment, um, enterprise servers, that's bottom right, computers, and uninterruptible power supplies, and the for each of them, there's a, there's a different version number of the specification, which is the current one that's operating, and the date that that came into effect um, within the EU, and then also the regulation number for the EU regulation. Um, you can access the regulations with, with all the details from the EU Energy Star website. Um, if you want it in another language other than English, then you need to use the Eurolex site to um, track those down, but the, yeah. So how do those, how does this work, this EU energy star specifically? So the, the ownership is still very much with the US DOE and EPA who develop specifications and revise them, but they take on board views from international partners, including the EU. When e, the US Energy Star have adopted specifications, then the EU decides when and how to formally adopt them into the EU Energy Star. Um, and they are supported by the what's known on the website as the EU Energy Star Board, but sort of within the um, systems of the EU is called the Bureau or Export Group. Um, and I'm giving you a, a link to the website with the details of that group, their members and their minutes and so on at the end of the presentation. Um, just in terms of what's going on in the process at the moment, so version 7 for displays um, was released by the um, EPA in November 2015 and takes effect in the US in July 2016 and version 3 for enterprise services in development. I meant to say, I apologize, that um, those product groups really are product groups that cover, in some cases, quite a wide range. So for example, um, imaging products covers things like copiers, fax machines, multifunctional devices, printers, and scanners. And similarly, with the computers, it covers a whole range of computers. So it's not just one type. So while we're talking about labels, um, sometimes the physical label on a product isn't the most important way that labels operate. And this is the EU Energy Star as an example of that. Um, what, what happens um, with EU Energy Star is that manufacturers use the logo as part of their marketing. And sometimes they are labeled on products. Um, but because there are so many products, and because a lot of people don't buy them in a shop, they buy them over the internet, or they order ordering them for a big organization, the main way that people know what's an Energy Star product is through the EU Energy Star database. 
So we've got a screen grab of a particular example of the database up here, which I've just taken desktop computers um, and sorted them by a particular characteristic of them. Um, you can download that database, a uh, selection from that database as a spreadsheet or in any other way um, you can do it. Um, according to the website, um, over 130 participants, that is manufacturers or importers of equipment, have, um, are involved, have got products on the database. And at the end of the 2015, there are about 20,000 registered models. And about 67,000 visits per year are made to the database to, to track things down. So from that point of view, in terms of coverage, um, it's, it is well supported and has a lot of interest. But how else um, can we say does it have an impact? So that little logo at the top there is supposed to represent um, shopping. And um, so the NG Star impact is, is via shopping. Well, of course, you might say, naturally, um, that's what a label is all about. Um, but more specifically, Energy Star is on, on and within the context of office equipment, is very influenced by public sector procurement. Um, so in the second half of the slide, you've got um, the front page of US Presidential Order 13123, um, which dates back to 1999, signed by Bill Clinton. And that requires federal um, organizations, so anything to do with the states or directly federal funded bodies, to buy energy star qualifying products. Um, and that has spread down from the presidential level so that more than 20 US states also require anybody, organization who is directly state funded to buy energy star products. And then on the right hand side, um, the EU has done similarly. Um, in 2008, all EU institutions and member state governments buying above a certain threshold of products have to meet Energy Star. And then from 2012, all public bodies had to. So altogether, I think you can imagine we're talking about a huge market which only is allowed to buy products which are Energy Star qualified. Um, that's an enormous purchasing power, and it's an it, immense incentive for manufacturers to make qualifying products. Um, these office equipment is, is a very international market. Uh, it's made all, all over the world and shipped all over the world. So most people would want to have access to the EU or, and, and US market and um, get some of that. So that's predominantly how it has an effect, rather than individuals choosing to buy, an, in, in the EU, choosing to buy an energy star model rather than one that isn't. A lot of the time, you wouldn't be aware whether you were buying an energy star model or not unless you looked it up on the database. Um, so what has that effect in terms of the market? Um, in terms of the EU, it's very little data available about the market. Um, so it's quite difficult to be specific. Um, the concept is to have this market pull effect is that when the specification is set originally, only about 25% of products uh, qualify. And when 75% of products qualify, then you need to revise the specification. Um, the data I've been able to find is, which was gathered for DTNG, um, doesn't have the sales, it has the number of models. So it's not quite what you would wish for, but it gives you an indication of what's going on. Um, and this was some time ago, it was 2008, so this is looking at the market running up to um, the previous change in specifications of these products. And you can see that the changes a bit, the computers are a bit lower, but um, there was high there was a high penetration in terms of models um, before the specification change. And even when the specification changed, after that, there's still quite high um, proportion. So 50% of displays and 70% of 
um, imaging equipment already met the new specification as soon as it came in. Now, in some ways, that's not surprising because there is a, quite a long period where the specification is known, so manufacturers have got time to adapt to that. And as I said, there's this big incentive for people to qualify so that um, public sector bodies can buy their equipment. Um, but it still suggests that it really does have a power of the market. So that's our endorsement label. Let's move on to, let's go back to thinking about our different kinds of labels. And we're now moving to the right, to the comparative label. So there are different types of comparative labels. Um, to, again, uh, categorical labels where a particular product is put in a class or a grade, and then w you're shown the whole range and all the other different grades. And then you have that, like the EU label, which is on the left. And then you have um, ones that aren't categorical, which have a sliding scale, and the product is shown against the whole scale. That's the right. That's um, the US Energy Guide label. Um, most countries that have adopted labels use the categorical label, and there is strong evidence from studies of consumer, uh, consumer preference, but also comprehension in terms of how they use the information to make buying decisions that it's more effective. Um, the US and other places in North America and Canada and Mexico still use the um, sort of sliding scale. Um, and there, there are lots of different types. I should have said really designs of categorical labels, but they're all categorical. They've all got that in common. Um, but you can use stars to indicate you know, how good things are. You can use numbers. Um, Sometimes, um, like the top right one there, which is from um, Thailand, um, higher is better. Or, no, sorry, I'm getting confused. So in both of those cases, one is better, sorry. So that's Thailand. Then we have China, we have Taipei, and at the top we have India. So they're using, trying to use things that make sense to people. So you get sort of stars like hotels, you get grades, we use grades like HG, well, A is a good grade at school, um, being number one is a good thing. So it's kind of tapping into people's existing knowledge about what's good. And you can see that using color as well to kind of make the point. Um, so categorical labels, or comparative labels, are very popular. Um, a couple of years ago, there were more than 80, and you can see they're spread over all the world, uh, every inhabited continent. Um, some of them are voluntary. I'd say more of them are mandatory than voluntary. Um, you can also see, possibly, if you can hear a little bit, um, some labels that look rather familiar. They look quite similar to the EU label. They're using aspects of the design, um, and that's certainly true in uh, South America, in North Africa, and South Africa, as well as other parts of Europe that are not members of the EU. So um, a while ago, the Commission funded a study to look at that influence of energy labels and standards from the EU um, worldwide. And one of the outputs of that um, was this graph, which shows, I hope it's not too confusing, it shows the date of the introduction that's on the x-axis, and it shows the country. So the first country being Canada and the most recent of the, they only looked at 40 countries, not the whole world, to make it slightly more manageable. The most recent was Jordan um, in 2012. So uh, hopefully you can see, let me just um, highlight that for you. Um, here's the EU. So we're the fifth. Yeah. Um, quite early into the game, but not right at the beginning. Um, and if things had gone as perhaps might have been expected, um, it might have been the first part of the world to introduce categorical labels. So this shows the history of um, policy development. 
And you can see for labels, it was a very long road. So the first strong thing from the, from the Council of Ministers in 1976 um, went through various stages. Um, and the first label actually being in effect was until 1995. So nearly 20 years to get to that point. Um, quite a, a complicated road. Um, I've got the eco design there, or the minimum energy performance standards in there, just to give you the context. So as long as it, it well, it was very slow road to get labels. Um, most MEPs didn't come in until the eco design directive in 2005. So labels had a, a strong head start within Europe. That was very much the, the leading policy for a long time. So the 1992 directive introduced it's a framework directive, and then you've got individual um, directives for the individual products. Um, and that framework directive stayed in place until 2010, when it was recast, um, just continuing with the history. So part of the recast was about the coverage of the different products that um, could be labeled. Um, and it moved from energy using products to energy-related products. So things like windows could be covered, um, not just things like fridges, which use the energy themselves. And the other big change was the under the old framework directive, only products in domestic use um, were allowed to be labeled, and that was removed when we went, got to 2010. So in, in principle, any product could be labeled if it was useful. The other big change was the physical label itself. So we've got um, the old label on the right there and the new label on the left. So the old label was in two parts. There was a, a universal part, which was graphic. And then there was a part that was in the local language, in the member state. Um, and that caused some difficulties, because you then had to marry those two parts together, put those two parts together when it was actually going on a product. Um, whereas the new label is, as far as possible, not got language on it. So it's using these icons and um, using language that is just universal. It's some Latin on there. You've probably spotted. Um, so the concept was you'd have exactly the same label everywhere in the EU. Um, so the, the framework directive was involved in 2010. You could start using the new label in 2011, end of 2011. And it was, um, sorry, you could start using it immediately, and then you had to use the new label by December 2011. The other important change was um, the, the need to put the label when you were selling remotely, distance selling. Um, and in spring 2012, that became a, a requirement. And that was particularly important as internet sales um, had become increasingly important. So. If you weren't physically seeing the products in the shop, you needed to be, when you were looking at the product and looking at the information about it, you needed to have the label there. So you could, that could influence you in the same way as if you were in a shop. So what kind of products are we talking about here? Um, since the recast, um, energy labeling regulations have been developed alongside eco design regulations. So the first three criteria we've got here um, are directly from the eco design directive. Um, so you're basically talking about mass traded products where there's a significant impact from using the product or, or, or manufacturing the product, any, any part of the life cycle, um, and room to improve that without excessive cost. And then in terms of the label, there needs to be a range of product performance so that some, you know, the, you can choose something that's significantly different um, and get information about that from the label. And generally, we're talking about consumer products and not professional purchases, so there are some exceptions to that. Um, the selection of those products that, that are looked at with a view to regulating is under um, working plans. Um, there's a separate webinar on that, uh, describing that process if you're interested. So in terms of once you are looking at a particular product group, I'm not going to go into detail of this, but it is, like I said, sort of aligned 
with the um, ECOSOM process, and this is a schematic of that. There's much more information about that on the introduction to the ECOSOM webinar, which you can have a look. Um, I think the main thing to bear in mind is that this is quite a long process and quite complicated. It's long in terms of um, elapsed time, so we're talking about you know four years or more. Um, but there are also several phases where um, stakeholders can get involved and make their expressions, make their feelings and views clear. So we're talking about um, industry trade associations, um, NGOs, and member states. So it's a, it's a collaborative process. In that sense. So what has that actually meant in terms of which products have, have been labeled? So um, our first page here is products that were under the original framework directive. And the dates are shown are the dates the label took into effect, not the date of the regulation. Um, all of these have now been updated, so they've been revised, with the exception of tires and water dryers. So um, just to talk you through rather than being cryptic about it, um, so we start off with domestic um, fridge freezers or fridges or freezers. Then we have washing machines. Uh, we have lights, lamp lamps. Um, air conditioning, dishwashers, dryers, wash dryers, and electric ovens. Uh, we also have tires, which weren't part of under that original framework directive because they're a bit, again, they're energy related rather than energy using. Um, but they were done quite early on, as it were. So that's the first first set. Um, since then, we have added a whole series of um, other products. Um, some of these are, will be less familiar to you, and I might not have selected a photo that is a particularly good example of, typical example of what, what we've got, but um, I apologize if that's the case. Again, it's the, um, the date, the date that the the regulation first took effect. So we've got TVs, vacuum cleaners. Um, sorry, I start getting slightly nervous. Solid fuel boilers over here. Uh, professional refrigerated storage cabinets. So that's the first professional um, product. Then we've got local residential ventilation units, um, local space heaters. Sorry, space heaters and boilers, local space heaters, water heaters and hot water storage tanks, domestic gas oven hobs and range hoods. So that's the range hood, which is like that. So there's quite a lot of quite a lot of labels out there. Um, I'm not going to talk through this, um, but I wanted you to have a list of the current um, regulations. As it says, they on the DG Energy Way page, um, there's a, a list which has links to the, saying what all the regulations currently are, and with links to take you through to, to get the individual details if you want them. Um, things change with products. Um, all the regulations have built-in review dates. Technology changes, and sometimes um, there are some unintended consequences for the way the uh, regulations are written. So there, there are loopholes that um, have been spotted. Um, so there are reviews on a regular basis. And these are the products with energy labels, which are uh, at a stage of review at the moment. We've got TVs, washing machines, washer dryers, dishwashers, fridges and freezers, and lighting. And those are the links to the um, Proprietary studies that will tell you what's going on with those. Um, once they move to consultation forum and, and further down the process, then the DGNG website will be a good place to look and see what's going on with that. So I just thought it was worth having a quick look through 
the design and the features of the label itself. I know for most people who are um, attending the webinar, this is probably a very familiar um, thing that you just take for granted and you don't really think about. But um, there are some, I think it's just worth sort of just looking through what's there. Um, I've chosen to look at a washing machine label. Um, there are as many, all the labels are slightly different, um, but they tend to have most of the same features on the product um, applied to both. So I'm starting off with the category. Um, that's the key part of the label, uh, the thing that most people take in, the simplest thing, and gives um, intended to give a really clear idea of uh, well, how this product compares to other products. Um, so you've got the, the classification, in this case, A++, against the scale, so you can see how that adds up. The scale itself, using color, green is good, red is bad, and the length of the, um, the bars, so the least energy efficient has the longest bar, to kind of emphasize that point of which is good and which is bad. Um, the categories for most products aren't based on the, the thresholds for them aren't based on actual energy efficiency in itself as energy efficiency value. They're based on this energy efficiency index. And the basic idea of that is that um, the performance is a ratio of that product over a reference product. So the higher the energy efficiency index, the less efficient, the lower the more. Um, there's a webinar on eco design energy labeling for uh, consumer appliances, where um, there's a bit more detail on that if you want to, um, to look into that. So the range is set by EEI, and the, and the performance of the product you're looking at is set in EEI. So moving on, the next biggest and most important feature of the label is the energy use. Um, so here's where the Latin comes in. So it's kilowatt hour per annum, so it's per year. Generally speaking, it's, um, it is for a year. Sometimes it's for use, for a particular use. Obviously, in order to make, to come up with a value for energy use for a year, you have to make assumptions about how the product's going to be used. Um, and even for a fridge, which is running all the time, um, that might not be a good indication. If you have a particularly warm kitchen that your fridge is sitting in, it may use quite a bit more energy than the value on the label. Um, and for your washing machine, you might run your washing machine like me only once a week, whereas the standard assumption says two or three times a week. So it's not it's not going to be what you have in your home, but it it's gives you an idea and it's a way of comparing the different products. Um, and I think that's very useful because it is the, the main class is an energy efficiency index. It's not about energy use per se. It's how, um, for example, how many kilowatt hours it takes to wash a kilogram of clothes. Um, and you can get a bigger washing machine which has um, a higher classification, which will use more energy per year than a smaller washing machine with a lower classification. So it's another way of, it's another separate piece of information which is, which is useful. Okay, moving on. Um, nice, relatively simple one this time. So there's something about the capacity, the, the, the size of the product you're looking at, again, so that you can pair it with others. For washing machines, it's the weight, the maximum weight of a, a laundry, um, lot of laundry you put in at one go. And there are equivalent things for the other label. Um, then you quite often, though not always, get some idea about performance, um, how with using standard tests, just how what, how good is it this machine at doing a particular thing. Um, for washing machine, this is spin performance, so it's an AG rating. And then finally, um, you've got some other impacts from the product, so. Quite a noise is quite common to get that. And in this particular case, um, you've got two noise values. You've got the top one, which is how much noise um, it comes out of the machine when it's doing the washing. 
and then the bottom one is when it's doing a spin cycle. Um, and then on the left there, you've got the um, litres of water that the, the washing machine uses a year, again, with these standard assumptions about how much you use it and what you use it for. So that's kind of a, a round trip around the label itself. Um, it used to be that you had a regulation and it had a label on it, and that was the label until the regulation got changed. Um, with some of the more recent products um, and TVs, as the prime example, it was recognized that the technology is, changes very quickly, and also some eco-design um, rules were coming in that would take out the lowest categories on the label. So rather than so to, to try and take account of that, the, in one regulation, there were three different label designs, um, designed to be used at, at different periods, although manufacturers can use the more efficient ones so the, 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 with the highest efficient grades um, earlier. So you could currently see, for example, the right-hand label, the A++ plus D label on a product if manufacturers wanted to do that. Um, so that has some advantages um, because it's, you know, it allows if somebody makes a really efficient uh, TV that in, in that first label would be stuck in A+, plus, but is in fact A++ plus 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 in terms of efficiency. They can show that, but it's also potentially quite confusing. Um, the other product that that's been introduced for is vacuum cleaners. Um, so the HG label then was operating up to will operate up to 2017 September, and the um, A triple plus um, will go on from there. So you you can see one thing that perhaps I should have pointed out: there's only ever seven classes on the label at a time, so you never get A triple plus down to G. If you get a higher class at the top, you take one of the lower classes at the bottom. So that's what it covers, the process of developing it, and what the actual label looks like. Um, so moving on, what what has that done for us? What effect has that had? So there's different strands to that, and perhaps the simplest is, do consumers recognize the label? Um, they're not going to take any decisions if they don't even know what it is. So that's the starting point, good starting point. Um, so this is some a survey done in, uh, of 1,000 people in each of seven member state countries. So each of those represents um, 1,000 people being asked the question. You've got a range from um, some of the old faithfuls, as it were, a member of the EU, to more recent member like Poland. Um, and it, it's very encouraging, I would say. Uh, everything's, everyone's over 80%. And, a number of member states is about 95 percent. So almost everybody, when they're shown the label, recognizes that they've seen it. Um, and you can compare that with the car energy label, which has also been compulsory for quite a long time. Um, and a similar survey in 2012, only 51 percent of people were familiar with the label. So we're doing better than the cars. <laughs> um, so more importantly is once they've looked at the labels, do they take that into account when they're buying a product? Um, this is a rather busy graph, so I apologize for that, but it crams a lot of information into one thing, so um, I hope you can forgive me. Um, so this is specifically talking about a washing machine or a dishwasher. Um, they asked households in all these different countries, so those are the um, folks of the web, there be. And, um, and then they were asked, what do, you, what do you think about when you're buying one? And then, so we've got different um, colors. So the, the first one is low water and or energy consumption. So for almost all the countries, that was the top. Um, factor. And I think you could make quite a good case that before the introduction of energy labels, that probably wouldn't, would, 
might not have featured at all, and even if it did, it will be well down the list of what people are thinking about. So just that in itself is really important. Then um, you've got a whole range of other factors. Um, and then the lowest um, on this, I've chosen to put on this graph, but not the lowest of the numbers listed. There were another six factors which were less popular in terms of attributes listed. Um, so the light blue is the energy label itself. Does it, does it look good on the energy label? So it's getting, the energy label is A, making a difference in terms of making people think about energy and water. Um, and then in itself is impacting for a lot of people in a lot of different countries. Um, this is quite a big survey. It was 2,290 households. So reasonably, you know, reasonably robust. Um, and similar results in terms of how energy and water being used being high, and the energy label itself um, featuring um, have, have shown up in other surveys. Um, there was a survey in 2011 for a project called Promotion 3E, and had energy consumption at fourth most important factor behind cost, quality, and price list quality. So. The message is getting through that this is something we need to think about, and that the energy label is somewhere to look for that information. Um, a very recent, more more recent study, um, of just uh, just in Germany. So you've got a thousand German customers. Um, they were asked. This is quite interesting about different parts of the label. So the energy efficiency class. That was almost two thirds of people. Um, the annual consumption quite a bit lower at 33 percent, um, and I guess uh, okay, five percent don't care at all, but it's only five percent. So again, that's quite encouraging, I think. But there is more to how energy labels operate, how they make a difference to just people going in and, and looking at it and deciding, using that to decide what to buy. Um, it operates in a lot of different ways. So this is. Um, what the NG label enables. Um, apologies that the, the text is a bit small and difficult to read, so sorry about that. Um, so the first aspect is that having the information on the label and having that information available can help in policy development and um, refining it. So we've got policy evaluation and market data. It just generates enormously more data about what's going on in the market if any of you don't have labels. Um, it's relatively easy for um, companies who collect survey data and, and collect data from uh, retail outlets to keep track of what's going on. And that's really helpful in terms of um, finding out what's working and what isn't. Um, that in itself also has a direct effect on manufacturers and incentivizes them to make um, more efficient products. And then separately, you've got all these other types of um, policies that are much easier to do if you have an NG label. So the products are out there already, and you know what their performance is. They have to say what their performance is. Um, so for example, you get a tax incentive or a, rate, a rebate on your tax if you buy only the top rated um, product. Um, we've already talked quite a lot with Energy Star about the importance of procurement. So again, that can make, you can choose what level to set that and say we can only buy this type of um, product. So it's a very um, powerful enabling tool. And in combination with the um, minimum energy performance standards from Eco Design, which takes the worst products on the market. They really have had um, a huge effect on the market in the EU. Um, and as an illustration of that, um, here's information on refrigerators. So it's over 10 years, um, the, the years at the bottom there, and the movement in terms of this is sales, not, not models. So it's gradually turning from a sort of orange or yellow um, market share to increasingly green with the, the higher energy efficiency 
uh, classes. So there's quite a lot um, going on in there. Um, the A plus and the A plus plus classes were only actually took effect in 2004. Um, so classes B and C were banned in 2010. So you're happy to see that that's going down to almost nothing. Um, that's using the user design directives. Um, and the A++ plus 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 class was only added in 2011. So it couldn't, there couldn't have been any of that class in 2010 because it didn't exist. Um, so refrigerators are the oldest um, labeled products. Um, they originally go back to 1995. So that in itself, again, is really encouraging because even though the market had already transformed quite a lot between 1995 and 2004, it continued to change over the following 10 years. So it hadn't run out of steam. There was still scope to do more. Um, if you look at um, this study that I've pulled a graph out of um, so from, from top 10, they've got similar data for washing machine, and it shows a very um, similar picture. So, so far it all sounds great. Um, everything in the garden is lovely. We have got a label that people recognize and they understand and they take account of and um, it's having an effect on the market. But there are some issues, perhaps you won't be surprised to hear. Um, and that's illustrated by the graphs here. Um, and these issues are particularly the case for products that have been labeled for quite a long time. So one of the things is that the, um, the label shows classes, um, and we've got examples here for various different products, where you can't actually buy the eco-design directive has taken the low classes from the market. So it shows A triple plus to D, but in fact the lowest you can buy is A plus, and the same is true of dishwashers and fridges. Um, drive and to some extent for TVs. So that's quite misleading. You sort of look at that and you think, oh well, you know, you might look at that and think, oh that's only first. Okay, it's not the top, but it's pretty good. So I'll buy that. But in fact that's the worst you could get. And you don't get an idea of that from that graph, from that picture. Um, the other thing another thing is that most of the sales are in the top classes. Um, and when in, uh, that's sometimes called um, a saturation. So again, there's, you're not really seeing what you're. There isn't much difference in what you can buy. And then that, the other side of that is that there are much better products that you can't tell they're better products because they haven't got a class that shows that. And you've got some quite dramatic, the worst ones being washing machines. Examples of that. So 50 cent better. 40% um, better, 20% better. Associate, uh, all, another issue around that is that um, there have been consumer surveys which show that A to G labels are more effective than A++. So people conceive that an A is better than a B, but they're not so sure how much better an A++ plus is better than an A, an A++ plus 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 is better than an A++. Plus plus. So they don't take as much notice of them. They're not as convincing if you have all these A pluses at the top. Um, so these are all factors that were looked at in the review of the energy label uh, for the commission, which was published in 2014. And um, the response, the commission is in the process of responding to that at the moment. Um, their proposal came out uh, in July last year. Uh, you can see there's three, there's a lot more detail in the proposal, but the three basic aspects are um, rescaling all the existing labels so they're only A to G, and rescaling that regularly so that um, you don't get the situation where everything's an A and it's not serving a purpose. Um, secondly, when there is a class where you can't buy that product, actually making it clear on the label that that's the case. 
And thirdly, and this would be quite transforming, having an online product database which uh, manufacturers and importers have to put information about their product on there. Um, there's some debate as to whether that should, so that's similar to the situation for Energy Star that we've been talking about before. Um, some as to whether that database is only for people working for member states and the Commission who need to know what's going on in the market, uh, or whether to make it accessible to consumers so they can use it in their shopping. Um, there are some issues around rescaling, because then there's the possibility that a product that was a, uh, an A yesterday becomes a D today, and how do you get over that, and how do you manage that? And, and the proposal from the Commission um, has some suggestions as to how to deal with that, and also how frequently to rescale, and their suggestion is um, every 10 years. Um, there are some other aspects of the, the label that um, the proposal isn't suggesting change and has been, have been flagged as concerns. And one of them is around having the information without using any um, language so that it's universal, um, which means you've got these icons. And some studies have shown that consumers don't understand this. So I've, I've thrown up some of these icons. Um, admittedly, they're from different products, so I've muddled them all up. Um, but they're, so it's more confusing than it would be on a particular product. But they are not, I don't think they're that intuitive. I don't think they're that um, easy to understand. And I suppose I'd ask you, how many of those could you confidently say, oh, yes, I know what that is. I know what that means. Um, and my particular favorite for the most cryptic is this one I've highlighted. Um, OK, well, make your guess as to what you um, think that is. It's from the TV label, so that's your clue. Um, I can tell you it means that it hasn't, the TV has an off switch, or it's easy to turn it off without actually unplugging it from the wall. So yeah. I don't think that's that obvious. Um, some of the NGOs who have put their um, proposals forward have suggested that we go back to labels that have um, individual member state languages on them. You know, technology is a lot more um, sophisticated now. It would be much easier to create labels that are in individual member states who wouldn't have to physically have two parts of the label that you stick together. Um, I, this is my personal view, I, a lot of research shows on labels in general that the simpler they are, the more people understand them and the more they pay attention to them. So an alternative to that, again, particularly with technology moving on, and um, if we have the product uh, registration database, is to make a lot of this information available not on the label, um, but via there's putting a QR code on the label, which then can take you somewhere that has all this other information. So if you're really interested in you know, how many liters of water a year get used or how loud the air conditioner is, um, you can find it. But you're not sort of trying to uh, deconstruct all this information on a label that's most, first and foremost about energy efficiency. Um, and you might say, oh, well, what if people don't have web access or they don't have a smartphone to do QR, um, to do to look at a QR code? And But if you're in a store, um, then most ass assistant could have a tablet and bring up the information for you and, and do comparisons for you. So that would be um, my suggestion. Um, just to finish off, what the process and the timetable for the um, revision. When the Commission put their proposal out, um, they were suggesting that most changes would take effect from January 2011, so starting rescaling the label. Um, but the product database, which would need more work to get going, to come into effect from January 2019. Um, the different steps 
here are taken from a European Parliament briefing, which came out in October 2015. Um, so the green ones had happened at that point, and the red ones had still to come. We have moved on from there. Um, the IPRE committee, who are the main committee responsible for this in the European Parliament, um, published their draft report in January. The latest information I have is that the committee vote is scheduled for the 15th of July, and the plenary parliament vote, um, which is that, um, the last but one step here, um, in the 7th of September. So whether that will mean um, that we'll be able to meet the timetable as things starting to take effect from January next year, we'll have to wait and see. So that concludes my um, presentation. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Um, I hope you've got a, a clear idea now on the EU Energy Agency label and the EU Energy Star label. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yes, I did promise you some more information, <laughs> and here it is. Um, so those are links to the main, the main sources of information. Okay, that really is it now. Thank you.